All right, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kate Schwanhauser and I'm the events manager here at Food and Water Watch. And I'm so glad that you are all joining us for this afternoon's Livable Future Live, where we will be discussing our latest research report that we released last week about the Colorado River water crisis, which really digs into the threats that big agribusiness poses for water security for communities who are dependent upon the river for their water supply. We are gonna give people just another minute or so to get logged in. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just go over a couple of quick housekeeping reminders and share some other upcoming events that you can join us for. Um, so first, just some quick Zoom reminders for everybody. Um, if you need to turn on closed captioning to add subtitles to your screen, click on the show captions button in your Zoom toolbar to turn those on. Please feel free to also continue to use the chat box during the event as a space to share your thoughts and have a conversation with other attendees here today. We'll also have some time for Q&A with our staff experts. So as you're listening, if you have questions for them, drop those in the Q&A box and I'll keep an eye on those. And finally, I am recording today's conversation and I will share that later this week along with any of the links that we share in the chat today. So just to get us started, um, a bit of background on who we are. So Food and Water Watch is a national organization fighting for sustainable food, clean water, and a livable climate for all of us. And we do this by mobilizing grassroots activists to build political power at all levels of government. We're working on federal legislation that would bring sweeping change to food, water, and climate policy. And we also have organizers, some of whom you're gonna hear from today, working on the ground in states across the country on issues that are impacting their local communities. And it's really you, our members, who make all of that work possible. We don't take any corporate funding. We are entirely a grassroots movement. So becoming a member truly does make a difference in this work. If you'd like to become a member, you can make a gift today uh, by texting the word gift to the number 23321, or we'll put a link in the chat for you as well. So a lot of you know that today's event is part of our monthly event series called Livable Future Live. Uh, this is just a great opportunity for us to come together as a community to learn more about current events, our organizing campaigns, and hear from leading experts on these issues. So I invite you to join us again at one of our upcoming events. Next month in September, we'll be discussing food and farm policy as we interview Tom Philpot, who is a former farmer, a food policy journalist, and author of the book Perilous Bounty. We're actually going to take a break from the series in October to host a very special event called Against All Odds, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But then we'll reconvene um, in November to discuss PFAS, which are dangerous forever chemicals that are contaminating our drinking water. And we'll talk about what we're doing um, to fight that. And then in December, we're going to be hosting a sort of state of the union talking about the climate, uh, looking, looking ahead with some lessons as we go into a big election year in 2024. So I mentioned against all odds, um, this is our annual benefit to protect our planet. Very excited that this year we're gonna be hosting both a virtual conference on October 11th and a reception uh, the following day on the 12th in New York City. So you can join us online in person or both. And we've got a really great lineup of speakers for the virtual conference, including actor and activist Jane Fonda, two incredible youth activists, Elise Joshi, who's our executive director of Gen Z for Change, and Vic Barrett, who is a plaintiff in the Juliana versus the United States climate lawsuit against the federal government. They'll all be speaking at our opening session. And then we will also have a session about climate anxiety, something that I know a lot of us are feeling. And that'll be led by expert Sarah Jaquette Ray, She'll be sharing some advice from her book, A Field Guide to Climate Anxiety, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet. And we also wanna give all of you an opportunity to shape the topics that we'll be diving into at the conference. And you can do that by voting for our People's Choice session. So we'll put a link in the chat where you can cast your vote to decide on one of the topics that we'll cover. Just be sure to vote by September 1st. And you know, finally, as a thank you for joining us today, uh, we have a special discount code for you to sign up for this event. You can register using the code FUTURE to save 20% off on all ally level and defender level tickets. And that code is valid through this Friday, so be sure to sign up soon. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, 
Today, we're going to be talking about Food and Water Watch's new research report called Big Ag is Draining the Colorado River Dry, which takes a deep dive into the impacts and threats that agribusiness poses to water security in the region. And it also lays out the solutions that would really get at the root causes of this. So to start things off for us, we are going to hear from Kat Ruan, who is the researcher behind this report. She's going to share an overview of her key findings, and then we're going to turn to a discussion with her and two of our organizers from California and New Mexico, which are two states that rely on the Colorado River. And together, we're going to be talking about the work we're doing on the ground in states to protect people's water access. So please join me in welcoming Kat. Um, thanks so much for being here this afternoon and for the great research report that you've put together. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I'll turn things over to you to sort of set the stage for us. Perfect. I am just going to share my slides. All right. So hello everyone. Uh, like Kate said, I am Kat and I will be discussing our brand new research report out about the Colorado River. So to orient ourselves a little bit, I want to start off with just a map of the Colorado River Basin states and what the percentage of their total Colorado River allocation looks like. So despite the name, the Colorado River is a lot beyond just Colorado. It makes up these seven states in the West and eventually winds its way down to Mexico. Now, this issue has been in the news a lot recently, right? Most recently with this top comment about how the Colorado River has lost 10 trillion gallons of water since 2000 due to the climate crisis. And that is a terrifying statistic to start off with. But most of the news coverage has been around how the political debate has been shaped about where to make these cuts that we know we need to save the river. And this is for a good reason, right? That good reason is that the Colorado River Basin is essential to so many different people. So it's home to 40 million people, all of whom are dependent on the river's water in one way or another. It's also home to about 30 different indigenous tribes, seven wildlife refuges and 11 national parks. But in addition to all of these people and these different ecosystems, it's also home to some more insidious users. So here we found in this report that across all basin states there are 2.7 million acres of alfalfa grown and 2.5 million cows living on mega dairies. And when we say mega dairies, we're using the definition that they have over 500 head of cattle. Now, in addition to all of that, it's also home to two of the nation's largest reservoirs. We have Lake Mead up in the top left and Lake Powell in the bottom right. And you can see here on Lake Mead, right, these lines where the water used to stand versus where that water level is now. And I think this is probably one of the most stark kind of reminders and images that just reminds us how our mismanagement, how our climate change has really, really drained this river dry. Now, these two reservoirs and their associated dams are also responsible for about 10 billion kilowatt hours of energy every single year, but that is now at risk, right? If the rivers lowers much more, it won't be able to funnel those dams, it won't be able to power the hydropower, and all of that disappears, which is a crisis state that we don't want to reach. But let's take it back, right? How did we get here in the first place? So we have to start in 1922 with the Colorado River Compact. The upper basin states over here on the left, we're scared of California. We're scared of its growth, of its expansion, of how much water it would need to grow. And they wanted to sit down and make an agreement. So they sat down with federal officials and between all of these states, they came to an agreement. They would allocate 15 million acre feet between them all. Half of that goes to the lower basin, Arizona, California, and Nevada, and they allocate it into hard numbers. The other half goes to the upper basin where they have a little more leeway for fluctuations or for differences because they allocate by percentages. Now, an additional million acre feet would later be allocated for Mexico with later treaty. Now, this is all well and good. Remember, we started out with 15 million acre feet, but what quickly became clear to scientists was that this was an overestimate. This was, 1922 was a period of abnormally high rainfall, so 15 million acre feet was an overestimate. In a typical year, only about 12 to 13 million acre feet are actually flowing through this river. 
So to begin with, we're starting from a place of deficit, right? We're starting from that place of default, and now we're adding climate change, we're adding mismanagement, we're adding all of that, and we're getting to our current problems and our current crisis. So like I said, one of the best ways to visualize this is with Lake Mead. So here we have Lake Mead in August of 2000 versus Lake Mead in August of 2021. And when you look at that side by side, it's very clear what's happening, right? The system is draining. We don't have enough water and it's not looking good. And this is what has really prompted the federal government to begin getting involved in this, to begin declaring shortages on the river. So in the past few years, they've declared several shortages along the river, which has cut into the lower basins allocations. The Bureau of Reclamation only holds authority there. So that's really only where they can make these cuts like this. And we're seeing that Arizona and Nevada particularly have seen their allotments slashed in recent years. But even still, even with feeling those shortages, it's still not enough cuts. So ultimately last year, the federal government stepped in again with an ultimatum. They said, either the states need to come to an agreement to make way more cuts than have already happened, or we're going to do it for them. States eventually came to an agreement where lower basin states would cut about 3 million acre feet over the next few years. And that's a, that's a start, right? We need those cuts, but it is still nowhere near enough. Scientists are saying that we need about four times as much to actually make any meaningful difference in recovering these reservoirs. So the compact is the overarching water law, right? That governs all of the states. But when we look a little closer, we have these two principles that come into play. And that's prior appropriation and beneficial use. So prior appropriation, as stated here, is the basic principle of first in time, first in right. This means that those who have the earliest claims on the water, who were there first, have the most priority on water allocations. They have senior water rights, in other words. Those who come later get what are known as junior water rights. And this is a big deal during times of shortages, because during times of shortages, when their cuts need to be made, they are not made equally between the two groups. So for example, a junior user could see basically their entire water allocation slashed to zero before a senior user will see even one drop less. And in practice, this is very dangerous because in practice, the senior users are typically agricultural users, whereas the junior users are typically municipalities, they're domestic users, they're residential users. So that sets up a very dangerous dynamic for shortages in the future. Now, the other principle is beneficial use. Beneficial use is pretty simple on a face value. It's just the idea that this water must be put to good use. And good use has a very vague definition. You know, it could be agriculture, it could be domestic, it could be mining, it could be recreation, et cetera, et cetera. But what's tied into this is the idea of forfeiture of rights or the principle of use it or lose it. This is essentially the idea that if a user does not use their entire allocation for several years at a time, it may be cut, it may be reduced, or it might be eliminated altogether. Now that's a problem, right? That has created a system where we are just incentivizing water waste. You're incentivizing the system to use as much water as you possibly can, even when it might not be necessary, even when it might be better to just conserve it, save it for later. Altogether, not a good system for the changing climate that we find ourselves in and not a good system for the mega drought that we are now seeing across the West. And the big piece that is consistently left out both of the compact and of all of these discussions are tribal water rights. So theoretically, they should have the most senior water rights, right? They were here way longer than any of us, but that's not the case. We have about a quarter of the Colorado River technically allocated to these tribes, but a lot of tribes see their rights held up in Congress. They're being debated in courts. You know, They have to make these final settlements before they are legally entitled to anything at all. And even if they do get those legal settlements, there is no guarantee that they're actually able to access that water or pull any of that water. So while we see these tribes are struggling to just, you know, maintain basic public health or to just maintain their drinking water, we're seeing that agriculture is pulling an absurd amount of water for really, really unsuited crops. 
And that brings me to my first problem that our paper addresses and that I'm going to be talking about, which is alpha, alpha production. So like I said, this is grown on 2.7 million acres of land across all basin states, making it one of the most dominant and the most water intensive crops in the region. Now, we all know this is a very arid region, right? They don't receive a lot of precipitation. It's very dry. This would not be a crop that is found naturally. And it's not, right? It's not native to these areas. We farm it there and we have to use intensive irrigation in order to grow it because there is so little rainfall in many of these states, which of course causes a huge, huge problem. So brings me to my little audience question. I would love to get some guesses in the chat. If you haven't yet read the report, how much water do you think goes to alfalfa on a yearly basis? And this is across all Colorado River Basin states, not solely from the Colorado River, it is from all sources of water. We'll give some time. Okay, so I'm seeing some guesses in the chat. I like the one that says way too much, that is correct. So it's actually over 2 trillion gallons of water that we found was going to be used for alfalfa every single year. And this is a huge number, right? This is like a mind boggling number. Um, so I'm going to contextualize it a little bit. We can see that the 2.2 trillion gallons is enough to supply the 40 million people that live in the basin their indoor household needs, it's enough to meet that for three and a half years. Or to put it a different way, it could meet 140 million people's needs for an entire year. So when you're kind of squaring those two up, right, it's a year of alfalfa or a year of water for 140 million people, the decision seems pretty clear. We also found in this report that a lot of the water is going to the largest farms. So we found that those over a thousand acres make up less than 2% of total farms in the area, and yet they consume over one third of all irrigation water, which is just a ridiculous and outsized amount of water to be consuming. And this would all be one thing if this crop was going to feed people, right? It was going to directly benefit these people who live in the basin, but we know that's not the case either. There's a big problem with external exports. So we see that Saudi Arabia, for instance, likes to export a lot of alfalfa. And that's a very interesting case, Saudi Arabia, because they have in fact banned the practice of growing alfalfa because it is so water intensive, right? So they've banned it in their own country because they know how much water it uses. And yet we're still doing that over here and allowing it to be exported. And that's going to support their dairies, right? This is the main use of alfalfa. And we're also seeing that trend domestically, right? So all of this alfalfa is being fed into these mega dairies and into these factory farms because that's the dominant use. That's really the only use of alfalfa. And that funnels into this little feedback loop. So as the alfalfa goes to these mega dairies, these mega dairies gain access to a relatively cheap crop. They can continue to expand. They can grow their herds. You know, they can benefit from that in turn encourages more alfalfa to be produced. It's kind of this vicious little cycle that just keeps going at the expense of everyone else. And now we're at the point where the West grows nearly all of the nation's irrigated alfalfa, despite, like I said, it being clearly unsuited to the region and despite the ongoing mega drought. Now, the other piece of the puzzle that we looked at in this report is the mega dairies themselves. So we found that across basin states, excluding Wyoming, Mega dairies use 218 million gallons of water every single day. And this is just to wash and hydrate the cattle, right? The majority of livestock, their life cycle footprint is in the alfalfa growth itself, it's in the growth of their cattle feed. That's where most of the water is used. But on the dairies themselves, they're still using enormous amounts of water. This also feeds into an, in, an industry problem of consolidation. We're seeing that most of the growth of mega dairies has occurred out in the West. Federal policies have kind of encouraged this change and put this pressure on all of these small farms and they can't keep up. It's forcing out these small farms 
as and their numbers are just declining, right? So we're seeing all of this water going to these big farms, going to these mega dairies. And this has also just created a system that is not resilient, right? We are not, the system is not built for climate change. It's not built for droughts. It's not resilient to things like pandemics anymore. It's a fragile system and we are all at risk from it. So our report also took a look at each state individually. Um, so we have unique fact sheets for all of the basin states individually. Um, this graph shows a very high level. I'm not gonna go into it, it's too technical right now. Um, but I think Kate is gonna be sharing all of those links in the chat. So if you are interested in a specific state and learning more about the unique problems to one state, I encourage you to check those out. So all of this water abuse is taking its toll, right? Whether you live in the West or you don't. For one, food security is being put at risk. So a lot of key regions in the area, so that primarily in Arizona and in California, grow much of the nation's winter vegetables. And despite what would seem to be their apparent value, a lot of farms and big farms will choose to prioritize things like nut crops over actual vegetables because they are more financially profitable, right? So we're putting that at risk when we're growing and spending so much water on alfalfa. Additionally, like I mentioned before, there's a threat of a loss of hydropower from both Lake Mead and Lake Powell. Those levels are dangerously low, and if they drop much further, the dams will have to be shut down. And with that loss of hydropower comes specific harms, right? The people depending on this hydropower are more often than not predominantly rural areas, they're predominantly indigenous, or they are low income because the hydropower is massively, massively cheaper than what can be bought on market. So without that, not only are people's wallets beginning to hurt, we're also seeing that there could be an increasing shift to fossil fuel energy, which is not something that we can afford to see. And then of course, beyond the human harms of all of this, there's also the destruction of ecosystems and how those are suffering with this. We know that obviously the most impacted ecosystems are those of the river itself, right? So those fish in the river that are unable to survive, but we're also seeing that a lot of land-based animals are also affected by this. That includes this little guy here, the burrowing owl, as well as you know the iconic saguaro cacti in Arizona and a bunch of other ones. And all of this is at risk because of our actions in the Colorado River. And I think the kicker is, right, we know what needs to be done. We know that big ag needs to be tackled and that we need to stop new alfalfa production, new mega dairy factory farms, and tree nut production. I didn't go too much into tree nut production in this presentation specifically, um, more of a state-by-state -state kind of thing. And we have a lot of research on that. But if you are interested, it is also in some of those fact sheets. And then with all of this comes a need to help transition farmers to more geographically appropriate and resilient crops. We need to define water as a public trust resource. And then we also need to pass fair farming legislation that will actually create a true sustainable farming system. So that is all for me right now. I'm gonna stop sharing. And then I think toss it back to Kate. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Kat. I think that's some really powerful research and just a great overview to introduce us to what we're up against. Um, and just a little teaser there of some of the solutions that we're working toward. For everyone here today, I do highly recommend that you all check out the full report um, and dig a little deeper into some of what Kat has just shared. We'll put the link in the chat uh, where you can read that and we'll also share it in the follow up email as well. Um, so now I would like to have Chirag Bhakta and Alexa Moore join us. Uh, they are members of Food and Water Watch's organizing team. Chirag is our California director and Alexa is one of our New Mexico organizers. So together we're going to dig a little bit deeper into these issues and just learn a little bit more um, about the campaigns um, that they're leading in their states uh, to fight factory farms and mega dairies and overall better protect and manage our water resources. So welcome. Thanks for, for joining us for this important conversation. Um, just to kick things off, uh, you know, Chirag, Alexa, as residents and organizers in two of the states that rely on the Colorado River Basin for water, can you share a little bit more about how you're seeing your local communities be impacted by this? Um, and maybe Chirag, you want to kick us off? 
Yeah, sure, I will. Thanks, Kate. Um, and also thank you, Kat, for that presentation. And big shout out to our research team, our wonderful research team, um, for putting these things together. Uh, you know, you know, although California enjoys senior water rights when it comes to the Colorado River and, you know, and is entitled to one third of the flow of the water, uh, you know, the state remains to face major water issues and inequities, particularly due, um, as, as, as Kat mentioned, to big agriculture's ability to use, and obviously from our perspective, misuse and exploit billions of gallons of water for their operations. Um, and all while everyday people, particularly those living in agricultural communities, face water scarcity issues um, and low water quality overall. Um, and the impact that it's having in California, quite frankly, is tremendous. You know, like it's it's uh, a really bad situation where a top five global economy, we have over a million people in this state that still don't have access to safe, affordable water. Um, that's over a million people in California in 2023 um, that don't have access to, to clean, safe water. Um, you know, actually last October, we went and visited some folks over in Tombstone Territory in the Central Valley um, who had literally nothing coming out of their faucets while their communities were surrounded by lush green fields, agricultural fields, um, using large industrial groundwater extraction machines for their water, literally sucking up the water, leaving with leaving the people with none. And much like how you know, in terms of water rights, California can continue to draw water from Lake Mead, even if it reaches at a dead pool, right? This issue that we have is systemic, right? You know, and it kind of points to misuse, mismanagement, and the overall unjust water infrastructure um, here in this state, um, and clearly along the Western U.S. Um, and, you know, and, and, and it's hitting a lot of people, you know, in, in different ways, right? So we're talking about people that don't have access, but also it's leading to water rate increases up and down the state. Um, you know, just here in San Francisco, where I'm based um, out on Ohlone land is we're getting about a 20% increase over the next few years here um, and up in Marin County um, and in Los Angeles, um, where about half the water actually comes from the Colorado River we've already seen restrictions um, and fears of future rate increases. Um, you know, we know California has a dwindling water supply, yet there is enough water if we manage it correctly uh, to supply our people with what they need and currently don't have, um, you know, support proper agriculture, honor tribal rights, um, and ultimately maintain uh, the Colorado River. Thank you. And Alexa, do you want to share some of what you're seeing uh, in New Mexico? Yeah, sure. So thank you so much again for having me. Um, in New Mexico, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff. We're seeing small farmers and rural communities facing water shortages. So for an example, in 2021, the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District banned surface water irrigation due to decreased flow. This forced farmers to switch crops or dip into groundwater supplies. Um, and the district is piloting programs to pay farmers to leave land unplanted with 2,500 acres left fallow in 2022. Um, additionally, decreased water flow means less aquifer recharge. And that's a source of water that many New Mexicans are dependent on. Domestic wells are generally shallower than agricultural wells, and that means that they're mo more prone to going dry. Um, drilling deeper, deeper wells is also expensive, and so many families can't afford the cost. And while corporate agriculture continues to pump more groundwater at the expense of everyone else. Um, some examples. So in the community of Magdalena, residents were left without running water when the water level in the town's sole functioning well dropped more than 15 feet within a year and then ultimately ran dry. Um, in Buena Vista, residents were left without running water following wildfire, wildfires and had to walk down to acequias to fill up buckets of water and haul them home just to use their toilets. A new domestic well for the town would cost upwards of half a million dollars and over 600 mutual domestic well and water associations in the state need similar replacements. So even if new wells are drilled, there's also not a guarantee that the water that the new well in the new well would last um, as the water levels are rapidly declining. So it's more important now than ever for New Mexico to prioritize communities and small, fact, or small family farms over corporate profit. Thank you both for sharing you know, the, the impacts and the incredible hardships that you're seeing in your own communities. And we are definitely gonna get to some of the solutions that we can work towards to help alleviate some of this.
Um, I do want to circle back um, to Kat to an earlier point that you made about tribal water rights. We've gotten a couple of additional questions coming in from the audience about this. Um, you know, some tribes have settled cases regarding their legal rights to water, but they're still unable to use that water. Can you just expand a little bit more on the on tribal rights to water and how, you know, this is kind of building on historic injustices? Yeah, of course. Um, so like I said in the presentation, right, tribes are in theory the most senior users of the water. They've been here for far longer than our government has existed, right? So legally, logically, they should be allocated huge water claims and huge water rights. But we've seen that the federal government has really hedged on this for decades, which in turn has just delayed their water rights for decades. And I've seen it said that they've essentially front loaded this drought, right? Where they have taken on basically no water for decades now and are now sacrificing it to other uses. As if that already weren't unjust enough, right? We have to talk about what happens if they actually can get those legal rights settled in court. So if Congress can pass it, if they can get those legal rights down on paper, it doesn't always actually guarantee access. Some of these settlements have little stipulations in them that say that the tribes themselves need to be the ones to build out the infrastructure to access the water, which needless to say, extremely prohibitive, cost prohibitive, labor intensive, et cetera. Um, and we can take, for example, the Hualupia tribe in Arizona, which is around the Grand Canyon area. So the river has bordered over a hundred miles of their land, but they haven't been able to draw a single drop from it while their rights have been debated by Congress and by the courts. Um, they actually eventually did get a settlement just this past January. And it had initially included that kind of provision that I was talking about, right? Where they have to pay for all the financing and the infrastructure themselves. That was eventually changed to include $180 million to provide that infrastructure to be able to divert the river water to their homes and to their businesses. But even still, right, that all has to actually be built out before they can really access it, adding on to those decades and decades of injustices. And who knows how many years it's going to take to actually build all of that out, right? It's 2023, the compact was written in 1922. The fact that they're just settling these legal rights now is appalling. And I think to kind of just add a little insult to injury at that fact is the idea that many of these tribes are being asked to lease out their water rights right now because of these shortages, because they need water to support other communities, hydropower, to support local ecosystems, things like that. And they're being asked to lease out these rights that they've just fought so hard to gain. Meanwhile, we're seeing big ag is still draining the river with impunity. Thank you. Um, and, you know, you've mentioned that, you know, this compact was written in 1922, over 100 years ago. M most people on this call know that the Bureau of Reclamation is currently putting together new guidelines on how to better protect and distribute water from the Colorado River. Um, you know, how have ongoing discussions about those allocations failed in the past? And what are we hoping to see change this time around? Yeah, I think there is a lot of infighting around this subject. Um, it's a very sensitive subject for a good reason, right? Water is so essential. But the real problem with these negotiations is just that they don't get to the heart of the issue, right? They don't explicitly target big ag. They don't look at the worst abusers in this case. Oftentimes as well, you know, because of seniority, it falls heavier on some states rather than others. And it's kind of been uneven so far. And Essentially, what we have at the end of this is a system that just keeps functioning as it was, right? There's no real changes. There's no fundamental changes to how the West is dividing up the water. It keeps this system that's not built for this permanent drought. It's not built for climate change. So unfortunately, we're just seeing that the status quo negotiations are no longer working. And I think one thing that kind of comes to mind is the idea that we could deprioritize alfalfa water use. And now this might not fall directly under the scope of these negotiations, but it's kind of the big picture type of things that need to be tackled and that need to be discussed if we're actually going to save the river. So were that to be done, were that alfalfa to be removed from those definitions of beneficial use, as I was discussing, big ag would no longer be permitted to draw such huge amounts of water for alfalfa growth, particularly in such arid areas or in such drought conditions. And of course, we also need to aid farmers in that transition, right? It can't just happen overnight, you ban it, and then it's gone. But 
that will take time and we know that it'll take time, which means we need to start that process as soon as possible. And so let's let's talk a little bit about how you know how we're doing that. You know, Kaz, you've been sharing. We know that big agribusiness is at the root of this problem. Chirag, you've mentioned this too. Tree nut farming, alfalfa farming, Alexa mega dairies. They're using billions of gallons of water in states like yours that are experiencing these record levels of drought. So in addition to sort of working at the national level, putting pressure on the Bureau of Reclamation, we've already gotten to work in states uh, like yours on the ground. Um, so can you both talk a little bit about the organizing work that you're doing in California and New Mexico to tackle this problem and bring about this transition that we need? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, here in California, we're getting people up and down the state activated in our new campaign, which we actually just launched earlier this year called Protect California's Water. Um, and we are taking it directly to the decision maker. So we are going directly after California governor, Gavin Newsom, um, as he has the power and ability to make the necessary changes um, and put the state, quite frankly, on the right path um, that we're a little bit overdue for at this point. Um, you know, so what we're demanding is that he use his powers to declare a moratorium today on all new factory farms, tree nuts, and alfalfa planting in this state. You know, one specific goal that we have, um, as Kat mentioned, is to strip alfalfa of its protected beneficial use status um, and thereby, you know, hopefully removing um, uh, much of its water allocations that it gets. Um, and, you know, kind of mentioned earlier, right? Like we are on the ground, uh, we're on the ground in the Central Valley uh, where we're seeing. Um, a lot of the front lines of, of this issue. You know, we were in Tombstone territory, as as, as mentioned earlier, um, but then also in communities impacted by water pollution in Delano and small towns like Shafter. Um, and additionally, you know, the, the, our staff and organizers in the state, you know, we're at various events and farmers markets, possibly near you. You know, I was looking at the chat of seeing where, where people are coming from, and there's a lot of folks from California here. So, you know, later on um, in 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 our in our in our event today, um, you can sign up to join the team. You know, fighting to end factory farming and water exploitation in California. So I hope I hope you all do so. Let me put the links up. Yeah, and I can talk a little bit about what we're doing in New Mexico. So we also just launched our campaign to save New Mexico's water. We're also pressuring the governor, Lujan Grisham, to direct New Mexico state agencies to prioritize domestic water uses over industrial agricultural abuses. The governor can direct state agencies like the Office of the State Engineer and the New Mexico Drought Task Force to take immediate action to protect New Mexico's water, and she needs to use her authority to do so before it's too late. We are working um, with communities on the front lines of this crisis. These are the people who have lost their drinking water and are experiencing extreme hardships as a result. We just also launched our volunteer team and are providing opportunities for people to get involved in the campaign by talking with their friends and neighbors, writing letters to the editor, joining us at events and more. We're also talking to people at farmers markets and clipboarding at grocery stores and co-ops to gather petition signatures to demand that the governor take immediate action to protect New Mexico's water. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, lots of lots of great ways um, that we're working on the ground in these states and lots of great ways for folks to get involved and we'll share some more on that in a bit as well. Um, so Alexa, another another question for you, you know, we've discussed a lot this afternoon already, you know, water usage with emphasis on lower basin states like Arizona, California and Nevada. Um, but what are some of the additional impacts for upper basin states like yours, like New Mexico? Yeah, so the most concerning impact um, for de decreased river flow in New Mexico specifically is to our aquifers. Um, we don't receive a whole lot of the Colorado River. I think it's about 6% of the overall amount in New Mexico. Um, but this water is used for both agricultural and public purposes. And while the river is not a large contributor to water in our state, any decrease in historical flow does directly impact both agricultural and public sectors. With less surface water flow, farmers have to increasingly depend on groundwater supplies and draining aquifers throughout the Southwest. The water table levels in the High Plains, for example, are declining at 90 times their recharge rate. 
So our aquifers are crucial to providing water to the state and 10% of the state's population relies solely on groundwater sources. So that's more than 200,000 people in the state of New Mexico that rely just on wells. Um, this increased groundwater usage by industrial farms means that the aquifer levels will drop more rapidly and residential wells will continue to run dry because they are no longer deep enough to access the water that they need. Thank you. Um, and I'm glad that you brought up this groundwater issue. Um, we've actually gotten a couple of other audience questions on this from Wanda and Mark and a few others. So I'm going to kind of paraphrase those. Um, and Kat, I know you've done some research on this as well. Do you have anything that you want to add um, about groundwater or other sources of water in these states and the risks that we might be facing there? Yeah, definitely. Um... So like Alexa said, a lot of these states are dependent on a lot of different sources, right? It's not all the Colorado River water in any of these states. Um, and there's a host of other surface water tributaries, things like that, that are way too many to mention right now. Um, but in addition to groundwater, I will also briefly mention snow melt as another big indicator, um, which is exactly what it sounds like, right? It's the water that flows down from these mountains. It's picked up there as snow in the winter, flows down in the summer, and it supplements a lot of these water supplies and flows into the bodies like the Colorado River. So it supplies the Colorado River at its headwaters and things like that. But we're seeing that with climate change and increased temperatures, more precipitation falls as rain instead of snow, so decreasing those snowpacks. The EPA has found that across the West, snowpack has declined at over 90% of sites surveyed, with an average decline of about 25% since the 50s. So we're seeing this is a massive change. It's melting earlier. It's upending trends. It might also heighten wildfire season because there's less water available later in the season. And then, like we said, the other flip side of that is the groundwater issue. So like Alexa said, this is what's built up and accumulated in those deep underground aquifers over hundreds of thousands of years, right? This is really old water. And it's what anyone using a well is usually pulling from. And it's also really the source that is being really abused across the West because like Alexa again alluded to, it's not able to recharge on these human time scales, right? It's not going to come back within our lifetimes. So when big ag is drilling down a hundred miles to get that water one year, and then needs to do 110 miles the next, it's because those water levels are permanently declining. So I think it's also a very powerful kind of big ag versus the people dynamic because it is big ag drilling these huge, huge wells and the, is people's wells that are the ones running dry. And yeah, like you said, we have a lot of additional research around this subject because it is such a big issue in New Mexico, in California, in all of these basin states. Great, thank you. You know, so we know that, um, you know, agribusiness, these factory farms, mega dairies are the real culprit here. And that's why Food and Water Watch is working so hard to ban factory farms and to pass legislation that would change our food and farm policy um, within uh, California, within New Mexico, but also across the country. Um, I know that we have a lot of people here joining us today who, you know, live in one of the seven states within the Colorado River Basin area. Um, but we also have a lot of folks who are joining us from elsewhere. So Chirag um, or Alexa, would you want to talk a little bit about what these fights mean for people who might live outside of your region? Sure, I'll just hop in real quick. Um, so while today we are talking about the Colorado River, a moratorium on factory farming does go beyond just water. It also protects our communities, our small farmers, um, and animal welfare. So any success that we have in protecting the water in the Colorado River Basin, states will set a precedent for work in other states, um, such as Oregon and Iowa, where we're doing similar work in fighting factory farms. I can add to that a little bit. Um you don't mind, you know, kind of the ripple effect of the progress that we make here um, in the American West definitely has a broader impact across the country, just as progress made in places, you know, Alexa mentioned Iowa or even Pennsylvania kind of shows us what's possible here um, as well. Um, additionally, uh, you know, Kat mentioned, you know, Yuma, Arizona and the Imperial Valley here in California grow about 90% of our nation's um, leafy greens. Um, so I would say that is one that 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 is one very broad impact um, I'm sure is felt for all our vegetable lovers, um, myself included. Um, and you know, just you know, all, like all of our work is connected. 
um, and like the momentum created in one space is going to fuel energy in other spaces. You know, earlier this week, I was actually hearing about a great factory farm victory achieved that we achieved in Oregon. Um, and I was inspired and fired up to take on a factory farm operator here in California. You know, like, you know, there's definitely no unconnected region when it comes when it comes to our movement. Um, and, you know, I think, mean, you know, kind of bringing a bit of a California bias here as we are the most you know populous state and the largest economy. Like winds here do have the possibility of shifting paradigms and forcing these industries to conform to our regulations and values. Um, you know, if we can end fact, if we can end factory farms, stop fossil fuels, improve it here, I, I you know I would say we could undoubtedly prove that as a country as well. Great, thank you. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I really love about hosting these livable future live events and about our food and water watch community is just how um, excited everyone is to, to get involved and to be a part of the solution. I'm seeing so many people in the Q&A and in the chat really asking, you know, how can I help make a more sustainable food system? How can I help protect our water? What can I do to be a part of the solution? So can you all talk a little bit about, you know, how people can get involved in these efforts, what can they what can they do today? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, if you're in California, uh, first of all, hello everybody, um, welcome. Um, there are a few actions you can take right now. Um, so, the first is to add your name to our petition uh, to protect California's water. As I mentioned, we're calling on the governor to not only have a moratorium on factory farms and uh, tree net production, but we're also we're also going ahead and trying to stop oil and gas extraction in this state as well. So you can add your name to that petition. Um, I believe it's in the chat. Um, thank you for tossing it in there. And also you can join Food and Water Team California. We actually have our monthly meeting one week from today, next Wednesday, um, and you can sign up at the link in the chat. Um, so very excited and eager to see um, some of you who are here today. Um, on our call next week. And Alexa, what about folks in New Mexico? Yeah, so if you're in New Mexico, um, same thing. We also have our Food and Water Team New Mexico that we just launched. And um, we do host monthly meetings where we offer trainings, opportunities to take action, and the ability to meet like-minded um, New Mexicans who've had enough and are standing together to demand change. You can go on ahead and get involved by filling out the form that we'll be dropping in the chat here in just a second. Awesome. And I'll just share that we do also have ways that you can get involved no matter where you live, anywhere in the country. Um, the first that I'll share is something quick that everyone can do today in under five minutes. Um, and that is to send a message to your members of Congress to support the Farm System Reform Act, which would enact a lot of the sweeping change that we've been talking about that we need today. It would get rid of factory farms and it would provide support for transition to more sustainable farming methods. Um, so you can send a message through the link that we'll put in the chat. It's very important that our elected officials hear from us on this issue. Um, and another way that you can get involved no matter where you are, Chirag talked about this a little bit, um, is by joining our Fair Farm Bill Action Team. Uh, the Farm Bill is a massive legislation package that's rewritten every five years and it directs how billions of dollars of funding are spent on how we grow food in our country, what type of food we grow in our country, and we are fighting to make sure that it includes policies that will rein in factory farms and protect water resources and prioritize more regenerative growing practices. And all summer long, volunteer members of our Farm Bill Action Team have been tabling at farmers markets across the country to gather petition signatures in support of the Farm Bill. And there's still time for you to get involved in your own community. We've collected over a thousand signatures already, which is fantastic, and we want to collect even more. Um, so if you'd like to get involved in that effort, we'll put a link in the chat where you can get started and someone from our volunteer team will reach out to you with some next steps. And we do also have um, an In the Weeds uh, teach in event next Tuesday to learn more about some of these farm bill priorities and how you can get more involved in that. Um, we have about 10 minutes left together today. So I want to just turn to a couple of the questions that have come in from the audience in the Q&A box as we've been chatting today. Um, so first, um, uh, one that I think is really important that Abby sent in, um, Triag, maybe I'll send this one over to you. You know, what effects did heavier rain and snow this year have on water supplies? Are we still in, in a drought? 
Uh, yeah, we are still in a mega drought, I would say. Um, I mean, you know, I would, you know, in California, at least for the last two, I mean, also for the rest of the American West, um, you know, for the last two decades, we've been a historic dry period. Um, and we've had some short, very short periods of intense rain and snow. Um, and I, you know, obviously I'm sure this question, you know, from what we had last winter with the huge number of atmospheric rivers and resulting flooding um, is a bit of a sign of what we'll see every few years one wet season within very consistent, or sorry, within consistent, very dry years. Um, and, you know, like, and while that might temporarily increase the amount of available surface water that we have, um, you know, like we continue to face serious long-term challenges for our people and the environment, uh, particularly because our groundwater supplies remain significantly depleted. Um, and will continue to remain depleted if we continue the way we're extracting um, right now. And, you know, like, you know, while we might hear that there is a, there is a little bit more in our Sierra snowpack, um, it provides, it provides a relief to a lot of people, um, to millions of people in California. Great. Thank you. Yeah. I think that just really underscores that we do need some of these bigger policy changes to help, you know, mitigate, um, mitigate that and make sure that we have these resources at a sustainable level going forward. Um, let's take another question um, from Norma. She's asking, how has fracking contributed to this issue, both from supply use and water contamination? We've been talking mostly about factory farms today, but we know fossil fuels are a big part of this. So wondering if someone could speak to that as well. Yeah, I'm happy to hop in here. Um, this was actually something we had originally considered folding into this report, but it just ended up being too much information for one report, but it is extremely important. Um, we know that the basin is a major hotspot for oil and gas exploration. That includes New Mexico, which is the second highest crude oil producing state. It includes Colorado and Wyoming, and all of these are in the top 10 for natural gas production. We're also seeing that after a little bit of a pandemic slump, oil and gas production back on its previous growth trends. And with that, comes this increased risk for both water use and for water quality. So typically we know that the requirement to drill and frack a well is between one and five million gallons per well. For instance, we found in our California report that from January 2018 to March 2021, the oil and gas industry used more than three billion gallons of fresh water for their drilling operations. And we've seen that in the Permian Basin, which reaches into New Mexico, water use per well in 2019 was 29 times greater than it was in 2010. So we know this is sucking up our precious water and that that rate is increasing, if anything. There have been some moves to kind of stop the use of fresh water in these operations. But even if you do that right, it doesn't stop the threat that it poses to the actual water quality of our supply. And a lot of the water that is being impacted is groundwater. It's a very dirty industry. In 2021, for example, there were 15,000 spills across New Mexico associated with wells and facilities. There's also a very infamous case in Wyoming of Pavilion, which has been a site of controversy for decades, right? We saw residents begin to complain about tainted water back in the 90s and the EPA, and then later some Stanford researchers found that the fracking industry was to blame for this, right? The, sta the Stanford researchers found that there are chemicals related to fracking in the drinking water, and they found that they are doing this fracking dangerously close to groundwater. State officials to this day kind of claim that it wasn't fracking that did this, but we know from this case study and from a host of other case studies, when you're fracking near groundwater, that water supply is at a much higher risk of this contamination, and that can prove very dangerous for people. So, you know, we have this situation where not only is big ag draining our surface water, but big oil is taking advantage of our groundwater and contaminating anything that's left over. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's just a really important point about how interconnected all these issues are. You know, we can't solve the water crisis without addressing climate change, without addressing how our food systems um, are run. So um, great question. Um, okay, we are coming up on the end of our time here, so I'm going to wrap us up on Q&A, but I do just want to put in one final plug um, to make sure that you do check out this research report um, and dive 
deeper into what we've been discussing today, I just dropped the link to that in the chat one more time for you all to access, and we'll share it along with those state fact sheets that Kat mentioned earlier, um, along with the recording of today's event. So I want to thank everyone for joining um, for this for this discussion, for sending in your great questions. Thank you, Kat, Chirag, and Alexa for being part of this as well. Um, I have a couple of final reminders before I close us out this afternoon. Um, so first, you know, I really do encourage you to become a Food and Water Watch member. You know, as we've talked about today, we are, you know, going up against some of the biggest corporations, um, some of the deepest pockets, um, but we ourselves don't take any corporate funding. It's really members like you that make our work possible. Um, so if you can, please consider uh, donating and becoming a member of Food and Water Watch. It really goes a long way towards building our organizing capacity and the grassroots power to work together for a future where our water resources are protected. Um, so thank you all again for that. Um, and I do hope that we will see you at our upcoming Livable Future Live events. Um, over the next few months, we will be discussing um, food and farm policy uh, with Tom Philpot. We'll be discussing PFAS and the dangers that those pose to our water supply and ways that we are fighting to keep our water clean. And then we'll be discussing um, at the end of the year, our state of the climate uh, to look at some lessons learned as we head into a big election year in 2024. And I hope that you'll join us in October for Against All Odds. You can take part in our virtual conference featuring Jane Fonda, sessions on climate anxiety and the People's Choice session that you can vote for. Or if you're near New York City, I hope that you will join us in person to celebrate at that reception. Um, and don't forget that we do have a special code just for you as a thank you for joining today. And that's valid through this Friday. Um, and I know that we have shared a lot of links um, in the chat today, so don't worry if you don't have them all saved. I will send out an email tomorrow morning with all those links, along with the recording of today's conversation. Please do feel free to share that with family, friends, colleagues. It does take all of us to make this future a reality, and we're grateful for all of the work um, that you're doing to make that happen. Uh, finally, in about an hour, you will receive a text message um, or email asking you to submit feedback about today's event. Please leave a comment. We love hearing your thoughts on our monthly discussion. Um, and that's all. So thank you all again for joining us for uh, this month's Livable Future Live event. I hope that you all have a great afternoon and we will see you next month. <laughs>